This is Profit Talks, a podcast produced by Hayek Global College and dedicated to exploring how you can ethically maximize profits. For more episodes, please visit hayekcollege.com slash profit. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, my guest is Eric Sebastian Tandazo. How are you, Sebastian? Hey, Tom. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, I'm doing good. Doing very well. Thank you for asking. So, Sebastian is a good friend of mine, and he is also the vice president of Alpax, a boutique investment bank based in Latin America. He has more than 10 years working in corporate finance, advising clients from multiple locations in, in Latin America, and is a true expert on uh, M&As and the whole investment bank industry, corporate finance in general. So it's a true honor to have you here today, Sebastian. Oh, the honor is mine, Ed. So tell us, what, what is this industry all about? What do you do? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a question I get a lot. It sounds fancy, right? Investment yeah. banking. So in a nutshell, what we are is we are corporate financial advisors. So what we do is we help our clients raise money in the capital markets. We assist in mergers and acquisition activities, and we provide other various advisory services. So pretty much we are a one-stop shop of financial advising for our clients. In other words, how you can see it is we, we assist in large, complicated financial transactions. These include, for example, that you need some advice regarding the value of your company. And if you are thinking about an acquisition, a merger, or a sale of your company, we, we also help you advise on, on, on what's the best structure to, to do this deal. Also, we help our client raise money that could be through the issuing of a stock or through another fund provider. For example, in Latin America, we have these multilateral organizations like the Intermer the Inter-American Developing Bank, Development Bank of Latin America, all, all of these different institutions which help uh, w- with funds to Latin American companies. So we are like the liaison through with the company to help them get the money from this organization. Great, great. So you, when you say you're a boutique investment bank, you're not actually the bank where people put the money inside, right? Correct. You're, just, yeah, you're the, more... What, what you're referring to is a commercial bank, the bank that you know that the savings, that you have your savings account, yeah, yeah. and that gives you the money to buy your house, to go to school. No, no, that, that, that's commercial banking. I'm like in a, in, a, in a different division of a bank. I mean, the corporate advice. Yeah, what you're referring is to the commercial bank. Who are your typical clients? It depends. Uh, our clients are, I had the luck through my career to work with, Companies, for example, in the financial sector, commercial banks, insurance companies. I work with dairy companies. I work with universities. I work with retail chains, pharmacy chains. So, our clients are, or what, what? When you, when we talk about boutique, is that we, we, when you hear this word boutique investment bank, is that we are specializing in something. Some boutique investment banks specialize in certain in a certain industry. However, we are a boutique investment bank because we're specializing in Latin America. Perfect. Do you specialize in any in any certain industry, or is it for any type of in, business? In, in our bank, we we do uh, one one of our our core uh, uh, added value to our clients is that we. We've worked with many transactions, in certain specific industries, industries in which we know we know that, that we we know where where the value comes from. So some of them are, for example, financial services. Uh, we we focus a lot in financial services, so commercial banks, insurance companies. Another big one is retail. We specialize in retail. Um, also, is a con- mass consumer markets like things like dairy. Um, a production of food, those type of things. Those are like our core, our core industry that we work for. So, so tell us, if if I was a a business owner here and I'm having the the day to day challenges of growing my business, you know, and uh, I was an entrepreneur and I I became successful, I'm growing, 
And then I want to take the next step, right? Or to find new options for, for my business. Maybe I want to get some more investment uh, money to my company to, to make a franchise, to open more stores. Or maybe I just simply want to find a seller, uh, a, a buyer for, for, for my company. Uh, what should I do? What, what, what should I worry about when I'm in this process? Well, the, always the first step in a process, like you're mentioning, is to, is to look back and look really deep into your company and see what is what you need. Because there, there are many things that are important, but just to put like in a nutshell, is like you have to figure out what you want in terms of, of, a, of a partner, meaning like, for example, you need a strategic partner. That means, okay, I need to grow the business and I need somebody that helps me not only with money, but with the knowledge to go to the next step, right? Or, sure. for example, I need a, a, a financial partner, somebody that injects money in the company because I need that money to grow. So the first step is look back, look, look into yourself and look, okay, what do I need? Okay, I need to grow and I know what to do to grow. Okay, perfect. Then what I need is the money to do it. Then I try to go and find somebody that helps me with the money. However, if it's the case that, no, I, I know I want to grow. However, I don't know where, what's the best way to do this growth. But I, and I also need money. Then I go the other route. I go to, to the route of a strategic partner, somebody that can help, not only with the money, but also with the knowledge to grow. So I think that the first thing that, uh, that you need to know is, is be sincere with yourself. Look back into your balance sheet, look back into your strategy and say, okay, wh wh where, am I, wh where, where are my low points? Where do I need, to, where do I need, I need to do better and focus on those things. Yeah, so, so just so we clear out for for our listeners here, what's the what what exactly is a strategic partner and a financial partner? What's the difference between the, the two? The, the strategic one brings to the table not only the money but also the knowledge. I'll give you a, a clear example. For example, I'm a I'm a and I'm thinking of growing my business. Perfect. Okay. If I if I already have the I, I know that to grow my business I need more production capacity, right? Yes. So then, then you go and say, okay, perfect. I'm going to need money for this. So I try to go and find money through a bank, through a multilateral corporation, yeah, issuing some stocks, something like that. But it's because I only need the money because I know the plan. I know what I need to do. However, let's say, for example, I want to grow, but I need to grow. I, I want to expand to a different country. Then what I need is perhaps not, not, I don't need that. I don't need somebody that only gives me the money to go and buy something or to put shop in the different country. But then, what I need is somebody that brings me something else. Somebody that brings me knowledge of that country, knowledge of that market. Then, the strategic partner not only brings the money but also brings that knowledge that you're lacking, make that endeavor uh, more successful. Perfect. And it could be either industry-specific knowledge or country specific knowledge or any type of, of knowledge exactly. that you can bring to the table, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a gray area, but you have these private equity funds, right? Private yes. equity funds are a great area because these guys bring you money, but also they bring you some good expertise, perhaps in the industry or perhaps about how managing your, your company. These guys are, are very good at what they do. They're very professional. So sometimes they not only bring knowledge about the industry, but they bring you a processes, a structure for your business. They usually bring a CFO. They bring they bring they more professionalism to, a, for example, a mom and pop shop. So these guys are strategic in the sense that, yeah, they bring you something else, but they're also financial because they bring you money. And what they want is is make the business very profitable. So when they exit, they make more money. So yes, it, yes. It, it's a it's a it's a gray area. But going back to to a little bit to your point, if you're a business owner. And you're and you're trying to see what what to do. I think the first thing is to look back at yourself and be sincere and see, okay, what is what am I lacking, and start from there. Yes. Well, uh, Sebastian, from from my experience, what I uh, what I see, uh, at least when we look at the, some companies here in Brazil, is that uh, 
most part of the companies are are not not at the level of management that we would would be uh, transparent enough or, or or capable enough of of uh, looking for uh, a financial partner. And what I mean by that is that, for example, they they wouldn't have an audited balance sheet to 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 look to to go for for this next step. And I had uh, th- th- this experience in, in my our, our own family business, right? And we, we went through through that process. But what what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, do, do, do you need to, to make make your own house cleaning uh, before you, you you venture yourself to, to a new uh, step with, for, for an, a, fi- a financial uh, partner or strategic partner? Or, or can you can you go at any time and look and, and, and look and look for t- that type of business? I think perhaps that uh, more from a from a corporate advisor. The step that you mentioned about going outside and not trying to find cap find somebody else that's kind of like a a, a step after putting the, the house in place. Of course, if you don't have the house in place, you can go find somebody. However, uh, if you don't have the house in order, it's very difficult for somebody else to really assess what's the value of your company and for you to present to them what's the real value of the company because you don't even know what it is, right? So usually processes like uh, of M&A or to find financing are, are like a, a second step. Usually our advice to, to companies, me, me as a... As, as a financial advisor, not only to, to Alphax, but, but to smaller companies, friends, is usually, it's the first thing is to is understand your business, right? If you don't understand your business, you, you're you lacking information. Information is key here. So, if you don't understand your business, how, how can you know what to do next? How can you assess if your business is doing good? How, like, there are many things that this lack of information uh, like keep you, keeps you trouble, right? So the first step usually is is to put the house in order. And that doesn't mean, oh, I'm gonna get the best information system. No, that pretty much is okay, let's 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 start looking into the into the company, but as a business. That means okay, we're gonna establish a financial processes, accounting processes. Okay, perfect. We're gonna we're gonna establish a balance sheet, an income statement, which companies in theory should have, but you will be surprised at how often you see small companies don't, they, they have it just the requirement, but they don't understand the value of, of, of having that in order. And yes, also yeah. and also understanding it, well, like just to, this is a little bit more technical, but it's interesting. What a balance sheet is pretty much like, without the accounting terms, it is, it, it's, a, it's a way to record everything that has happened in a company. Yes, so you see yeah. the balance sheet, it's, 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 it's another, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a book. It's like, it tells you the story of the company, you know how to read it. So if it hasn't been recorded correctly, you, cannot, you can never understand that here. Then if you go to a P&L, a net income statement, it's more than just also a way to, to tell a story of what happened in a company, but in a specific period of time. Could be a day, a month, a year, usually income statements are a year. So what, what it tells you is, okay, during that year, what happened? What did you sell? How much it cost you to sell that? How much you spend it in managing the business to sell the product? And how much you pay in taxes? So you start from sales and you end up in net income. So if you, if you as a business understand that this is not rocket science. It, 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 it's fairly simple. It's just losing that, losing, losing that fear of a different language. Yes. <laughs> and when, and when, you, when you understand that, then uh, uh, you, you open so much more possibilities to understand your business and how to make it better. Because sometimes how, how family business start usually is, okay, you have a great idea, you establish your business, and you're really good at, 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 at that. You're really good at selling their products. You're really good at, at giving that service, but you see you all these bad You have some good technical office. knowledge, which is not business knowledge. Exactly. Right? That, and then you, and you're good and, at that sale. And then you have this back office, which you are afraid of. If you 
understand it, it gives you so much more value because then when you have that, you can start actually trying to see what's happening in the business and also following up on what's happening in the business. So when you understand yeah. that, you can start analyzing monthly. Okay, perfect. Now it's not only good to know that I sell, let's say a thousand bucks. No. Okay. But how much it costs me to sell those thousand bucks? How am I going to finance the next thousand bucks that I'm going to sell? And that's, that's very easy to do when you have, when you have established these financial controls and accounting controls. Yeah. I, I had an experience uh, with that in practice because um, I, I, I went to business school, uh, uh, my bachelor's, and then I got a master's in economics. I was never the accountant, did some accounting classes, but then got to the business. Uh, I did okay in the accounting classes, right? But then when I got the actual business, uh, you only look at, I went to look at the balance sheet and it was a completely messy. I didn't even know where to start. I didn't even know where to look. So what we did in the beginning was, oh, ignore the balance sheet. Let's take care of the numbers a different way. And then I realized after a while that I was trying to reinvent how I was supposed to do the, the, the financial controls without doing the accounting. So ignore the, the, what my first reaction was, ignore the accounting, let me do my financial controls here. And I started realizing that, no, I needed some, a couple rules to, to in order to, uh, okay, let, how am I going to deal with the assets because they're not really a, a, a cost or how am I going to deal with, um, I don't know, many, many different things, the revenue, many different things you have to deal with when you're doing the financial controls that were already established with accounting. People are doing this. Years ago, 500 years ago, this thing was invented, <laughs> and I didn't need to reinvent the wheel, you know. That so that was my personal experience, and I I, I realized in practice you now that the power of of using accounting to to do your financial controls, right? It's like looking at it this way. It's like you're going. It's like uh, let's let's say we're gonna go travel to France, and I'm speaking Spanish or I'm speaking English, and their guys are speaking French. Am I gonna be able to understand? Perhaps with sign language, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna. They're gonna understand me. I'm gonna be able to ask for a code. But what happens if I knew a little bit of French, just enough to to, to pass by? Man, it will be a way better experience. The same thing yes. happens in business. The same thing happens when when you understand accounting, because accounting is nothing more than than a language. You can see it as a language. It's the language that allows you to understand your business. So yes. I, I think sometimes what happens is that, yes, you go to business school and you have accounting one, accounting two, you have these classes, but I think the classes are focused on on, on a specific terms and on a specific things rather, rather than what... I'll give you an example I, I have with, with analysts. I, 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 in, in, the, in our bank, I'm... One in, I'm the one in charge of, of training. So what I see a lot is that these kids come with a lot of knowledge of accounting. So I ask them, okay, please tell me what's that it. Uh, and they just like a machine. They're like the a machine. They yes. go to the definition. Yes. Before, and, and I'm like, okay, perfect. But what does that mean? What it is? Like, what, what is the meaning? So I think. Why do you like, use it? Like, so, oh, oh, what it helps you do. Like, if you understand that EBIT is, is not that specific name but it's actually how much money you made after selling the business and taking into account how much it cost you to produce it and in how much to cost cost you to sell it to distribute it and to manage the business to be able to sell so when when you understand what it means and just not trying to memorize the the specific uh, name i think that's what changes and, and that helps and, and when I teach this to specific clients, uh, I try to, to teach them how to understand their balance sheet. They are surprised because they also go to these classes, they take courses, they take. But I think that there's a there there's a misconnection between what it means and the technical part, you know. And yes. when you actually yeah. understanding and you understand the meaning and you understand the, how powerful it can be to under to to know those things, it changes it changes the the way you see the world. And do you see this uh, as, a, as a problem in the way uh, people are educated in, in college? Or not as a problem, but as do you, do you think it could be better 
how how we we transmit the the knowledge in in college? I'm a little biased because I I studied finance and I studied economics. I studied both and uh, and and I always had a it was easy for me to understand these things. So I have a little bias, but I I, I think that what we're lacking is explaining to people that do an MBA or people that study management rather than than something specific as finance. What happens is that they they think that having a business is just selling it, is just selling something and not telling them, look, perfect, but to sell something, then you're gonna have a back office that you need to take care of it. Right? You, you're gonna sell something, but it's not just selling. That selling something is gonna cost you money. And to understand if you're making money, you need to understand accounting. You need to understand this thing. Because people, in, in, and I saw friends of mine that they did management uh, and these things, and, and they, they were afraid of finance. They were afraid <laughs> of accounting. That, that, that they were never told that, look, it's not, you don't need to be an expert in accounting. You don't need to be an expert in finance, but you need to understand it just enough to pass by. Yes. Because if not, if not, you you are not rigorous in, in your business. You're gonna be able to sell. You're gonna be able to have feeling in sales. But if you don't, if you're not able to control how much it costs you to sell that, your business is not gonna be profit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one one critique uh, that I have is that when when we are uh, in um, education. Uh, when, when, when professors are teaching in any given class in college, what, what normally happens is, well, you have the textbook, you have uh, all the concepts that you have to go through. I mean, I remember stuff I did in accounting, for example, LIFO, FIFO, and last and first out, stock control, or, or, and all, all of that stuff. But then I didn't need to use that, actually, when I came to the business. I, I needed the more basic but profound uh, 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 concepts to just be what you said, you know, understand what are the main indicators here that I have to look for to just see how the, the company is doing, the, the main performance indicators. Uh, or, I mean, basic things of finance, like understanding the time value of money. How do you, how, how do you measure how, how much a company is worth? Looking at looking forward, you don't have to be so technical, but just understanding there's there's these, it, if, if I sell a company in the future, it's gonna be worth less than if I sell it now. Um, and it, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's more of the basic stuff. And a way I see that we can make it richer is that we focus on the problems, right? What are the problems that people are trying to solve? What are, what are the, what are the issues? And then from the problems, you, 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 you try to bring the concepts in. And I think that gives a, a more, more clear uh, understanding of why are you, you're teaching that stuff to begin with in the first place. Right? Exactly. Well, well, as, as, as I see it, is, is moving, uh, like you will, it, it's also very important for you to understand the, the concepts. But I think what we're missing is that we're focusing too much in, the, in understanding the technical part and we're missing the meaning, you know, the meat. We're, yes. we're, we go to a test and they tell you calculate EBITDA. Perfect. You go, you go to the balance sheet, you go to the income statement, you get that. Calculate cash flow. Perfect. You, but you, what, what we're missing is okay. But what does what does that mean? Like yeah. how, how how we can use that to understand better how our business is doing? Like like what are what what is the what is the underlying? What, what's the? It's not only to learn the language, but how 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 that helps you the end game. You know how that yeah. helps you be a better business person. How that helps you grow your business. How that helps you manage the business better. I'll give you a, an interesting question here. Why um, is EBITDA a good uh, goal to give an executive for a company as a as a goal for him to to to, to get a bonus? I mean, could be, could be not, but could may, maybe there's other things that we could use as well. But why would you use EBITDA as a as a goal for an executive? You know, to understand if you're going to use that, you first have to understand the meaning behind. Why is what does EBITDA mean anyways? Why are you using this 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 and not other such as net profit, for example, right? Yeah. So and, one thing that happens that tell me. 
No, go ahead. No, the thing is like using the specific EBITDA, something like we, if you read any finance book, it will tell you EBITDA, you have to track EBITDA, EBITDA, EBITDA. But it's the, and when you, I get, I get kids that come from business school and these guys are very smart and they come and I ask them, okay, the same question that you did. And they all tell me it's because the book said it or it's because that's why everybody uses. But in the specific case of EBITDA, nobody tells you or, or nobody explains them that, look, in a business or as a business manager, what you're interested in cash flow, right? You're interested in, in how much money the business is making because how much money you're making is the indicator of, of how profitable it is, right? Yes. So if these kids come to and tell me, yes, EBITDA is earnings before interest tax and you add depreciation, amortization because they're non-cash items and that, but nobody comes and tells me, look, you do that because EBITDA is nothing else than a proxy for the level of cash flow that the company is making. You see? Yeah. So, 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 so that, 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 that meaning, that, that understanding, it's really simple. Just saying we use that because that's a proxy of how much money the company's making. Yeah. That is way more simple to understand that, okay, it's sales minus cost of goods sold minus the SGNA plus depreciation. Plus, <laughs> so, 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 you can go yeah, it's, both it's ways. asking the why, right? Exactly. Just it, it's asking the why. And, because we, we, I think in, in school in general, we're, we're teach to, to learn specific things and concept, concepts. What we're lacking is that we're, we're not being taught to, to look a little further and, and, and to ask those whys. And also yeah. thinking, you have to understand that in college, what you're trying to, you're trying to pass the class, you're trying to understand, I think that that's also an issue because if you're only trying to pass the class, you can memorize this and, 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 and you will pass, but we're missing that, 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 that understanding that of what it actually means and how it can help you further. Perfect. Exactly. And Sebastian, go, going back to here, the, the M and a process, what is the step-by-step -step process in a typical M and a? Okay. So an M&A process, basically, it, you can be in both sides. You can be the one selling or you can be the buy, the one buy. Let's go, let's start with the one selling, right? So for example, let's say I'm a, I'm a university, right? In your case, I'm a university and I'm at the point in which I'm going to retire. I have no, I have no family that can inherit the business. You know, you know what? I'm just, I just want to retire. I want to cash out. I'm gonna. I, I want to. I want to sell the business, right? So the first step usually is is it's you can do this by yourself or you can yeah, know. One thing that you have to understand an M and A process is usually the most important decision a CEO will have to go through in their pro, in their professional career. Yeah, they they could be involving developing a new technology, developing a new product, selling, but no, none of those will be as important as, as selling the whole business. So, for example, when you want to, you want uh, to sell the new product, you hire a marketing expert, right, to tell you how yeah. what's the best way to do it. In this case, it's the same. You hire an expert that is dedicated to this to help you to go through the process. Now, how the process starts usually is first, as I told you, is understanding your business. You usually go with a valuation of the business. A valuation, a really good valuation, is not only uh, putting some numbers in Excel sheet and going to a range of, of how much it, it, it could value. No, a valuation process is a is a is a in depth analysis of the business, is knowing everything that has happened, and also knowing where the value comes from, where 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 what are the strong points, where are the low points of the business, what how this business can grow, what what's the story of this business. Because uh, like anything else, uh, the value is perception, right? How much you perceive it can be viewed in many ways. Can be viewed of, of okay, how much I, something else costs. So I just relate it. Okay, if this costs this much, this costs this much. It could be okay. No, but if I 
by this I can make it grow so much more. So for me, it's for art. So it's very subjective, right? Yes. So yes. so for evaluation, it it a good valuation is not only a number, but is a it's telling the story of a business with a rigorous financial analysis. Let me ask you a question on the evaluation. It's a it's a it's a, it's not as it's not a simple problem, right, to, to make a valuation of a company. Because when you think about prices, right, you're, you're trying to put the price on a company. But when you think about prices, you know what the prices are because you have uh, competition, you have supply and demand, and then you, you reach a certain equilibrium in the market and you have a certain price for, I don't know, buying soap in a supermarket or any, anything we, we, we buy in our day-to-day -day lives. But when you're talking about a company, every company is unique and in their own way. So how do you price it? What are the methods that you, you use to, to come up with, with the price for, for a business? You, you, you raise a really good question. And because you're talking about two different things, you okay. have value and you have price. Let's go to value. What's value? Value is how much you think this business is worth, right? So for that, how, how you... How you get there, you, usually investment banks use three, three methods you use that, that are focused on different times. You have past, present, and future. I'll start with the future because it's the one that usually everybody knows is the, the famous DCF, discount or cash flow. What is this is pretty much is, okay, how, what, my, what can my business do in the future and how much money that will generate and you bring that into present time and into present time. So you have that that's one way to, to, to evaluate the company, right? That that's one way to, to say, okay, the company looking into the future, my company is worth this much. Then you have the present. The present is pretty much I'll give you an example. For example, in real estate, right? In real estate, what happens? I, I have my apartment and I want to sell it, right? Usually what you do is you see how much are similar apartments in the, in the same block are selling for, right? Mm -hmm. You compare it to today, how much these are selling, and you usually you use a ratio of comparison. Usually is the value divided by the square meters of the apartment, right? So you yeah. can get, so you say, okay, in my area, the square meter is selling for a thousand bucks. Okay, perfect. My apartment is a hundred meters. Okay, the value of my apartment is a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So we use the same concept, but with companies. And so what we do is we compare how much similar companies or companies in the same industry are selling for right now in liquid markets, in the stock market. So for example, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating a, a university, right? So I look into how much universities are being evaluated in the stock market. Understanding that, look, those companies are bigger than me. They have different uh, classes than me. We're not the same, right? But in theory, companies in similar industries must be having similar margins, right? Yes. So what we do is, instead of taking that value to square meter, what we do is we usually take the value to some specific financial account. In this case, we, the most used one uh, and the best one is having the value of the company divided by the EBITDA, and that gives you a multiple. So, for example, the, the, uh, the multiple is 10 times. You see your company. Okay, my company right now is having a 10, a 10 million EBITDA, 10 times 10, 100 million. My company is worth 100. And then you see, the, you see to the past. This is a similar method as the we want in the present, but rather than looking into valuations right now, you see into valuations in the past. You see past transactions and you see, okay, a similar company like mine was sold at eight times EBITDA, right? So then if you see, okay, eight times EBITDA, my EBITDA was 10, my company is worth eight. So you use these three, three methods, but not in separate. You, it's a, each one complements each other because you have the past, the present, and the future, right? Usually, mm -hmm. the future is going to be the one that gives you the most amount of money, right? Because that's the one where you put all your chips in. Okay, I'm going to grow this business. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, right? Yeah. 
And this gives you, let's say, a, a range between 80 and 100. Perfect. But then the other two, what they give, they give you to check if the other one is going too crazy. Because the I other see. one see real transactions. The other one see real, real, real things, real valuations. And, and perhaps those go between 60 to 70. So now you have different, you have three different ways to look into value. And then you can have an assessment to provide to your client a range. Look, between these three methodologies, we think that the value of the company is between these ways. That's value. That's the perception of, of, of a professional or anybody else of how much that business is worth. And then you have price. Because perhaps I can think that my business is worth $100 million, right? But the price is when somebody offers for it. When somebody yeah. tells me, look, I'm going to give you an offer for $70,000. let us go to a car. Perhaps I have my car. And because I love my car, I've taken care of my car. I think that my car is worth is worth twenty five thousand dollars. Perfect. And then I go to the market and everybody offers me twenty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> What's the price? The price is twenty thousand, but the valuation is where we can discuss valuation. Valuation is is the subjective part. Price is what somebody is willing to pay for. Excellent. And just uh, to see if I if I'm a good student here. The reason you use EBITDA is because, as you said, it's a proxy of cash flow and it's easy to compare with other businesses, right? No, and no, other it, measures. Why, why you use this? Why you use this? This method of enterprise value to EBITDA is there's like let's go back to the apartment example, right? Mm -hmm. There's many ways you can compare apartments, right? You can say, okay, perfect. I have a, an apartment next door is selling for a hundred thousand, right? And this guy has two bedrooms. Okay, so the price per bedroom is fifty thousand. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare mine. I have one bedroom, then my apartment is worth fifty thousand. Is that a good metric? Yeah, no, bro. Perhaps you could do bathrooms. Okay, I'm gonna divide the value of the apartment for the number of bathrooms. It's three. Three bathrooms. Okay, a hundred thousand times divided by three, thirty-three thousand. Okay, I have two bathrooms. My apartment is worth sixty-six thousand. So you see. You could use any any metric. any multiple any metric to compare, and then the question is: Wait, what's the best one? The market has said that the best one is a square meter price divided by square meter. Why? Because the size usually tells you tells you more than the number comes on the number of, of bedrooms, right? The yeah. size. Then to the size, what you adjust is adjust if you have better floors, if you have Location. more Location. So in a business, let's go to the same example. You could compare two businesses, right? And I could easily compare uh, the value of the company divided by sales, right? So let's say I divided my, my company is worth 100,000 and my sales are 100,000. Uh, sorry, 100, yeah, 100 and 100. And I have a, a one multiple, right? So then I multiply one. So I go to my business, I see how much sales I have, and I multiply by that. Is that a good indicator? Not really, because then you're comparing your business just at the revenue level, right? Just at the sales. But you're not comparing how much those sales cost you to actually make that sale, how much it costs you to make that product. So why you use EBITDA? Because if you go through a balance, if you go through an income statement, you have sales. You can compare at the sale level. That only tells me how much you sell some, how, how much money you were able to sell. That, that doesn't give me much. But if you go down a level, okay, now let's go to gross margin. Okay, if you compare through gross margin, now you're comparing not only how much you sold, but also how much it cost you to sell yeah. to sell that product. Then we say, okay, perfect. But that doesn't give me enough information. Let's go one more level. Okay, perfect. Let's go to EBIT. What's EBIT? EBIT is pretty much not only how much you, how much are your sales, but how much are your sales minus how much it costs you to make that sale, and minus how much it is, how much are your expenses to distribute that product, to sell that product, and also to manage your business in order to sell that product. That's why you go to EBIT. 
And then you say, but wait, EBIT doesn't take into account uh, depreciation and amortization, which are only accounting terms and, are, and not cash flow. And then you go to EBITDA. Okay, so EBITDA takes into account how much how much money the, you made uh, after selling that item, but also taking into account how much it cost you to make and how much you is, how much were your expenses to sell it. And also you add up how much accounting money was never taken out of the bid. And if you see that, it's better to compare at that level after taking all of that into account, that comparing it only to sales. That's yes. why you use EBITDA. And also because when you ask me the, the question, what is EBITDA? EBITDA is a proxy of cash flow. So pretty much what you're doing there is you're comparing, okay, how much a company is worth compared to how much money it makes from the operations. Yes, so that's yes. why you use EBITDA because you, you, use a re, you use a metric that takes a lot more into account. It not only takes into account how much money you make because it's it, it's like I'm gonna try to compare two apartments, but instead of only comparing how big they are, I'm also comparing how big they are, but also I'm comparing what type of floor they have, what type of, of things they have, how many lights they have. So it, it's each time you go further down into the into the income statement, more things are you're taking into account. So mm -hmm. the better you, the more you go down, the better metric it will be. We were in the process. After you do the, the valuation, what comes next? So you know the price now. What do you do next? You know the you know you know you know how much your business is worth. Then the next step is okay. Let's go with the client. And look, I, we think that your business is worth this much, and we think in the market we can find something around around that. So then the next step is to to figure out what's what's the best way to structure this deal. What's the best way to go for it? For example, this could be a a one on one having somebody you know a competitor that that ha, has always been interested in you and perhaps it's good to go only with him or you go to a a, a restricted restricted auction. You go through a process of having three or four specific interested parties that you know that they're serious and they know that they they will. They will give a, a, a good valuation for the business. So the next step is to how to structure the deal. After that, you start the process of selling the business. In this case, let's say we went with a restricted auction. Okay. In this case, what you do is these guys that 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 want your business, they need information, right? They need information to make an offer. So what you do is we prepare the marketing documents usually. Uh, uh, what's called an information memorandum, which is a, a, a around this big that has everything that the interested party needs to know in order to make to, to make an offer, right? So you start a process. So the process goes, we've decided what's the structure, and then we provide information to the, to the interested parties for them to do an offer. They do an offer, and you see which offers are serious and you see which offers are the ones that work for you. And after that, what you receive these offers, you select which ones go to the next step. What's the next step? Okay, perfect. You have to make me an offer, but think about it. If you're in the other side, okay, I'm going to make you an offer, but in order to actually pay that money, I have to review the business, right? Then comes what it's called a the diligence process in which the interested parties review everything about the company. Views the from the financial part to the legal part, permits, everything, right? It's like when you're buying a car, right? I'm a car, but I'm gonna take it to my mechanic to see if the car is fine. Because if the car is not fine, I'm gonna pay less or I'm not gonna buy it. Same thing happens here. You have a diligence process in which you review everything about the company. And after you have done the due diligence, then you they give you the, the final offer, right? Okay, perfect. I've reviewed the business and I'm going to pay this much money. And through all of the process, you also have the negotiations of, of the contract of the sale because compared to a car, a car is easy, right? I sell the car and that's it. Company, a company has employees. Company has company, a company 
company is liable for everything wrong that it did uh, tax-wise, right? Company has a lot more a, a lot more issues, right? So you also have to negotiate, okay, perfect. I'm going to sell the company, but I'm not going to pay you the whole price right now. I'm going to leave some part of that uh, to pay you later. And, all we all, uh, and I will only pay you this if nothing of these things that I've seen that are potential race happen. Give you an example, for example. Let's say you didn't file correctly the income tax, right? The, yeah. In the last three years. And you know the, the IRS can come back and tell you, look, you did this wrong, pay me money, right? So you usually what you do in the due diligence is you review the whole business and also all these potential contingencies, you put them usually in an escrow and say, okay, this amount of money I was supposed to pay you for the business, I'm going to pay it to you, but not right now. I'm going to pay you, let's say, in the next three years, and I will only pay you if this doesn't happen. And if this happens, we're not going to fight. We already, I already bought the business. What we're going to do is from that money that was even behind, that I'm going to take from that money to pay for this contingency. So you have this process of reviewing the company and negotiating how the company is going to be sold. And after that, it's shake hands, money passes, and the company <laughs> changes hands. That, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but in a nutshell is you do the valuation, you structure the deal, you get the offers, the, you review the business, the due diligence, and then you finish the negotiations, and then you shake your hand. And you pop the champagne. Pop the champagne. <laughs> uh, so it's very, it's very unique uh, how this business works, especially from your side, because you have experience with quite a few M&As, right? You, how, how many M&As you estimate that you have participated already? Yeah, well, let, let's say... Uh, hundreds. No, 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 not that much. In, in, in Latin America, we don't have the... <laughs> we, we don't have that, that amount of business, plus not, not, not all, all M&A transactions end up with the sales. Some of them end up in the middle, so... Let's say around 20, 25. 25. So you have already 25 M&A experiences. And when we when we see at a, at the typical CEO, as you said, he would probably go through one M&A in his whole life. And that's probably going to be the most important event that right. he's going to go through. And you see this quite a few times, right, in, in, your, in, your, in your career. And it, it seems to me that it's a very interesting experience for people who are entering the business world, and you know, just just to have very very good uh, a business. It, it looks in great career to be in. And if you were to give any any tips for people who want to join and become an M&A consultant, what would they be? People who are, want to prepare themselves to become a consultant like you. As you said, it, 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 it is a it is an exciting is an it is an exciting industry, especially in my case. As I told you, I've been very lucky to, to work in different industries. So it's one day is you're 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 in a process for a bank. The next day you're a dairy company. The next day you're in a university. So as a professional, it it, it is very interesting because you learn a lot from different. Groups. You understand that perhaps for a uh, university, what brings value is the amount of students, right? Remember, you can see, like, for example, the key performance or the key ratio for value can be can be students, then you go to you go to, for example, retail, and that's how much are you selling per meter square. So you learn it. For a bank, is how much your how much money you're being able to allocate and how and how much money you're being able to receive from your clients from same and second. So it, 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 there are completely different worlds, and you're able to see all of them. And for that, as a, as, as somebody, if I go back ten years and and they say, okay, I want to be in this industry. One thing, like as I tell the kids I interview for 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 some analysis positions, look, I. I Everybody can memorize what EBITDA is. Everybody can understand that. But then to apply how that works to a specific company is not, is sometimes not even written in a book. Sometimes nobody's going to tell you. Sometimes you're going to have to figure it out by yourself. So I, if, the, if I can see the best thing that you, 
can have is that he's always wanting to learn more. Mm -hmm. If you want to get into this business because of the money, perhaps you can do it. It, 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 It's very profitable, I'm not going to lie, but it's very long hours, very, very long hours, very, you don't have much time with your family, you're always working. Yes. Long hours, hard hours, a lot of traveling, stressful. As I tell you, look, you're working in perhaps the biggest decision of that business owner, right? So it's yes. a lot of responsibility. And if you don't have that that, that willingness to keep learning and, and keep interested in this, you're not going to survive. So, and if you are somebody that always wants to learn and wants to keep learning, it, it, it's going to make it so much easier and it's going to make you good in your job because... We, what we do is pretty much is we, we solve problems. The, the evaluation part, yes, is a difficult problem, but then the really difficult problem is the process of selling the company. It's the due diligence part. It's the negotiation of the part. It, it, it's, very, it's very difficult, and no, and never two companies are going to be the same. So you're always going to have to learn more, and you're going to have to adapt. So if you have that willingness to learn, I think that's the, the trait that you need. And, and yeah, so. how, how, how much would you say is uh, when you evaluate the candidates is technical knowledge versus ability to relate with people? Because you have to also relate with your, your clients, right? Do you dep- take- everything depends because you have two sides of, of it. Um, and you have, you have, I have, I, I have worked with colleagues that they're very technical, very good, and 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 that at the beginning it, it, it works right at the beginning. If you're going to be an analyst and if you're a guru of accounting, then yeah, it's good. But then at the end of the day, where where what we do is we are advisors. That means that we're with the client, and you need to know how to connect with the client, you need to know how to explain it to the client. So, personal part is very important. For the for the next steps in your career, for the first steps, that doesn't mean that if you don't have that, you cannot be successful. Look, I'm a I'm a very technical person. I was always I'm always been I'm not the most outgoing one. However, I learn to relate to the clients, to be able to speak to the clients, to explain to the clients, and that's why I've been able to grow through my career uh, so quickly as I have. So more more than the and that comes with a little bit of what I told you, this willingness to learn. Because if somebody comes with technical skills, perfect. But if he doesn't come with the technical skills, but I know that he can learn, and I know he wants to learn, I can teach him that. Yes. Sometimes it's better because they come from different companies already thinking that they know how to do things, and it's very difficult to, to first let make them forget those things and teach them my ways to do it, you know? Yes, so yes, sometimes yes. technical knowledge is, is, it helps you, it's always good, but I think it's better the willingness to learn. i give you an example. One of my colleagues, he did, he was a environmental engineer and then he did his MBA and he ended up in an investment bank. He didn't have business school before, he didn't study finance, he was an engineer. Mm-hmm. But he was good at understanding. He was really logical. He was very good with that. So he came to, he did the MBA and we, uh, and we did specific terms, specific things, but he was very good at learning, very good at knowing more, like in, in, in understanding and in developing further. So he did really good. So he perhaps didn't have the specific finance. Yeah had one or two finance classes in the MBA, but he came to work and he's doing really good, but it's because he was willing, he had that ability to learn. That willingness to learn, to accept the challenge. The ability first that you have, but then the willingness, because I've I've known many smart people that can learn everything, but if they don't want it, and they would just, they will not go further, that's it. I guess it's, it's, it's willing to get out of your comfort zone and learn new things, right? The most important thing of that yeah. attitude. Being 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 willing to 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 know that you don't know enough you don't know enough. 
and there's always something else to be learned. Yes. Because sometimes, sometimes business school tells you, okay, all these concepts, and it happened to me. I, I, I had the luck to be the first one in my class in finance. I had the best grade. I, I, and I thought I knew it. I thought I knew it. I, then I went, I, I, I remember, uh, I had the luck to have really good managers to work for. So I remember my first job in General Electric in the United States. I had Mary Brand Hoover. She was my boss. And she asked me to do very simple, something very simple to project the financial, the, the PL from one of the divisions. Then I said, I got this. I have all the classes. I went there, man. I, I was an Excel group. I did all these projections, all these statistical analyses. And I went to her and I was like, look, I have it. She saw it in one second. She was like, man, this is really nice. Really well done. She just, <laughs> she just erased it. She said, now, you see that old guy? Go talk to him. He's been here for 15 years. He knows what's going to happen. Go ask him. <laughs> he has, <laughs> he, he, he understands the business and he's the one in charge of that. Go ask him first. It was, it was a shock to me. It's not that you come with all this knowledge, all this technical stuff, but at the end of the day is, okay, <laughs> business works completely different. It's not how much you learn. It's, it's understanding how everything works. This guy that was there for 20 years, he knew that specific business, the expenses will not grow more than, let's say, 2% or something like that. But he knew it because he was there and he knew it, his knowledge was way, way better than my statistical analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so I came to business school with all this knowledge and, and it was a wake up call to see, like, okay, look, I have a lot more to learn. Not everything is a statistics, not everything is works as, as they taught me things in the real world work differently and I have to learn yes and our challenge at uh, the Hayek Global MBA is exactly uh, simulating the what what will, will, will happen in the real world like one example I give is you're never gonna have the uh, the best no matter how good a class you you take nothing is gonna uh, be, be uh, exchanged what what you find in the real world the, the, you only uh, learn uh, the hard things in the real world, right? But uh, there is a way to be trained so that you can get there better. We, we both played tennis. No matter how much you trained, no matter how much you tried, it will, would always be, be a, diff a completely different thing when you go to the actual match. The match was very hard. It, 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 like If you're not a good match player, uh, if you don't play matches, you're not you're not going to learn how to play matches. You have to play in, in the real world. But you also can train so that you can play a better match. And that's the process that uh, I believe in education should should play a role in, in an I MBA, think, for I example. I think on a specific... And in an MBA, I think what it will... For example, I, if somebody I interview for a position has done an MBA, what I try to assess if is if that MBA taught him enough tools to be competent in his job, and if he and if it those are if he's not competent, I'm gonna waste time trying to make him competent. So this school should provide you with enough knowledge to be competent in the job. But it also should teach you how to learn. How you do that is, for example, in the as you said, real cases. Though, though, though that training will teach you how to, to read your knowledge, how you apply it to real problems, and how to how you learn to fix things. You know. So I assess those two things. Exactly. And as you said, you, you, you something that people. Uh, I think forget is that education it, it it it's paramount because it could be an MBA it could be reading a book it, like but education what it does it allows you to understand the world in a different way know more and knowing more it it's it's power information is power and 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 it's not enough to be the smartest guy in the room in, let's go to your tennis analogy man you could be the the best player in the world you can have the best strokes you can have the best serve. Then you go to a match with somebody that is only good at 
and learning or understanding how to beat you. And he's going to beat you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, it's very frustrating. <laughs> the, not necessarily the, the, the best player wins, but the best one to adapt to the player wins. Yes. And, how you le- and you learn to adapt and, and, and you can be taught to, to learn, to, 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 to understand something else. Like you can be taught, you can be trained. The thing yes. is having the willingness to, to, to be able to learn something else. Perfect. Sebastian, thank you very much for our conversation. It was a pleasure talking to you. Oh, pleasure talking to you, Edson. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Profit Talks. Now, do you have any comments or other business-related question? If so, please send us, and we'll be glad to explore it in future episodes. Also, be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. We are on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and many others.